So guys, today we're going to be looking at FAI, femoroacetabular impingement. This is one of the conditions we get asked about the most when it comes to the hip joint. So if you're ready, let's dive in. Hey guys, Khaled here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So in today's video, we're going to be diving into what FAI is, some of the common causes or symptoms that people get when they have FAI, and of course, how we might treat it in practice. So let's start with a definition. What is FAI? Well, in 2016, we had the consensus statement from Griffin et al, which terms this condition as a movement-related disorder involving symptomatic contact between the femoral head and the acetabulum due to changes in their morphology. So let's break this down. Movement-related disorder. This means that symptoms come on when movement occurs at the hip joint, or specifically when a patient is moving rather than resting. Symptomatic contact. This basically means that when there is contact between the two surfaces, it creates the symptoms. So for the last part of this definition, let's look at the anatomy. So the femoral head and the acetabulum. Now the acetabulum is the socket shaped part of the pelvis, which the thigh bone or the femur sits into. Now, this statement and this definition suggests that when there is changes in the way that these bones are formed, then it leads to that symptomatic contact which creates the patient's symptoms. So with that in mind, what might be some of those bony changes? What might be those changes in morphology? Well, effectively, there are three different types of morphology that can lead to FAI. Those are a pincer morphology, a cam morphology, and a mixed morphology. So the first type is a pincer morphology. This is where we have an overcoverage of the femoral head by the acetabulum, or basically where the acetabulum, that socket feature of the pelvis, reaches a little bit too far over the top of the femoral head. This appears to be more prevalent in women, which is possibly due to the differences in female anatomy. Then we have a cam morphology. Now, this is more common in males by three to one. This is where we have osteophytosis, or basically additional bony growth on the femoral head or the femoral neck, which happens due to repetitive overload on that area of the bone during the growth period in adolescence. So here we might be thinking about our individuals who are involved in rotational and multi-directional sports where they have those repetitive overloads in those end range positions. Finally, we have the mixed morphology, which is where patients can have both a cam and a pincer presentation. Now, one recent cross-sectional study by Cloacy et al. investigated 1,130 patients and found that 45% of them had a mixed impingement morphology. They found that 48% of hips had a CAM diagnosis morphology, 45 had a combined or mixed as we said, and 8% had a pincer morphology. So it just goes to show that CAM and mixed are the most common forms. So that's what FAI is. Next, let's dive into some of the common things that our patients might say that might lead us to suspect FAI. So first of all, we've got groin pain. 83% of patients report these symptoms. We also find that patients might report a clicking or a catching sensation, which is aggravated with end range movements of the hip. We might find that their symptoms come on with positional movements, twisting, rotating, or even when they're about to try and sit down in a low chair. We find that the timing of onset can be insidious. 65% of patients say that things gradually came on rather than there being a specific trauma or a specific incident that started their symptoms. Of course, as we said earlier, we might be looking at the sporting population, the athletic groups who might develop these symptoms because of that increased repetitive workload and the fact that they're going to be more involved in those twisting manoeuvres. And of course, 15 to 25% of patients will have some kind of presentation of FAI, but not actually have symptoms. They could be asymptomatic. So bear that in mind too. So next, objective tests. What physical examination signs might lead us to this FAI diagnosis? Well, we've got this brilliant paper from Isho et al, which found that the tests with the best diagnostic effectiveness for ruling out FAI was when patients had no pain during a FADIR test and no restricted range of movement during a FABUS test compared with the other side. 
The most favorable ruling in test was pain during prone internal rotation of the hip when the knee was at 90 degrees, which presented a 94% specificity. Of course, we can also use x-rays in order to be able to supplement the findings when it comes to diagnosis. So finally, on to treatment or management. Now, patients with FAI can be managed conservatively, without surgery, or with surgery. Let's start with conservative management. So as physios, one of the first things we want to be thinking about is our advice and education. Now, we've already said that FAI is a movement-related disorder, and some of the key movements that we find affected are those twisting movements and perhaps deep flexion. So therefore, we might be thinking about explaining this to our patient, for them to look out for when they might be twisting more often and see if they can reduce that. We might also look to see when they're flexing their hip in a deep position. This could be things like deep squatting, lunging, or sitting in really low chairs. And perhaps we might see if they can think about how often they do this and try and make sure that they reduce their frequency. And of course, load management. So if your patient finds that they're part of that athletic population, for example, and it's those certain sports that aggravate their symptoms, we might need to discuss with them about reducing the frequency of which they're playing their sport, or perhaps the intensity, in order to try and help settle their symptoms down during that symptomatic period. So next, let's talk about exercises. Now, when I'm thinking about my rehab for FAI patients, there's two really key principles that I try and think about. Number one, we want to try and find out what are the movements and positions that are irritable for our patient, because those are the ones we want to improve. And then point number two, we might want to practice those irritable movements, but in a non-painful and non-irritable manner that doesn't flare up their symptoms. So basically, if we combine those, we need to try and recreate those movements that are painful for the patient, but in a way that makes it easier for them, so that it can get better in the future and that those painful movements become less painful. So one way you could do this is think about whether your patient gets their symptoms in either a flexed hip or bent hip position, an extended or straight hip position, or in a lateral or abducted hip position. So once you've worked that out, here are some exercises that you might consider in each different category. So if patient symptoms are irritable in that flexed position, I might think about starting with something like a sit to stand, but definitely at a height which is comfortable for the patient and perhaps starting on two legs to make it easier. I might then try and progress this to a staggered sit to stand where we have the more irritable leg backwards to make it more harder. And then we might think about doing something like a squat or a split squat, again, but making sure that the symptoms are still comfortable when the patient is doing that movement. So naturally, we're only going to be able to progress the patient when things are getting better. For your patient who's irritable in an extended or straight hip position, you could start by doing something like a double leg bridge. And of course, if this gets easier, you could progress it onto a single leg bridge. An example of a high level exercise could be a deadlift. As you can see, we're definitely moving into extension here. And if you wanted exercises for your patient who was symptomatic in a lateral or sideways position, you could think about starting with something like crab walking. And of course, making sure they're only stepping out as far as is comfortable for them. This could be progressed to something like monster walks. Or we could think about something like side planks, especially when you're lying on that painful side to really push that hip into a lateral position. Now, of course, if patients don't benefit from physiotherapy, they could be referred on to see a surgeon for a hip arthroscopy to try and change that morphology with surgery. Now, of course, patients don't have to be referred for surgery. It might only be if their symptoms don't improve with physiotherapy. Now, when studies have compared physiotherapy to surgery, the general suggestion is that within 12 months of symptoms, the outcomes are the same depending on which one you choose. However, the UK fashion trial from Griffin et al. suggests that when you consider after 12 months of symptoms, those who have a hip arthroscopy tend to report better functional outcomes compared to those who didn't have surgery. So therefore, it's always a consideration if your patient doesn't improve with physiotherapy. 
So guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button. Remember, you can find loads more content from us on our Instagram account, at Clinical Physio, and there's loads of brilliant resources on our website, clinicalphysio.com. My name's Khalid, see you really soon here on Clinical Physio.